I'll do first is introduce the other two people who will be speaking, and then I'll give a brief introduction about myself, and then we'll get started. But to my immediate left is Edith Newton Wilson, Dr. Edith Newton Wilson. She is the owner of the Rock Whisper LLC in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and her company uses creative and innovative geoscience technology and concepts to explore for and develop clean energy, potable water, and food security worldwide. Edith also provides consulting services to oil and gas and renewable energy companies. Edith's background for this is incredible. She has her BA in geology in 1982 from Dartmouth College, her master's in carbonate geology in 1986 from Johns Hopkins University, and her PhD in carbonate geology from Johns Hopkins University. Next. Next to Edith is Nancy Moran, and I, I think maybe many of you, probably many of you know Edith too. She's been very active in the community, and so is Nancy. Nancy Moran is an RM and a MS who's worked in public health nursing in Tulsa for over 22 years. She has a master's degree in integrative health and wellness and a focus for mind-body medicine. Nancy is an integrative, an integrative nurse coach, a yoga instructor, and a, and a collage artist. She's also a community activist who's been a community volunteer in various capacities, including founding the first transition living center for homeless people with chronic mental illness, leading the Tulsa Peace Fellowship, and most recently, she is co-organizer with me of the Tulsa Ready for 100 campaign. So I'll give just a brief introduction about myself. I don't want it to sound bragging. Usually somebody else does this, but in the interest of time, I will do it myself. I'm a retired law professor who recently completed a 44-year teaching career at the University of Tulsa College of Law. And while there, I served as vice dean and director of the Sustainable Energy and Resources Law Program and before that was associate director of the National Energy Law and Policy Institute. During my teaching career, I, for over 40 years, I taught a variety of energy, environmental, and natural resources law, including environmental law, climate change, energy in the climate change era, public utility law, oil and gas law, public utility law, and water law. And I'm currently of counsel with the water law firm of Patrick Miller and Noto, an Aspen-based water law firm. So it, So thank you so much for being here this evening and giving Nancy and Edith and I the opportunity to tell you about one of Tulsa's most significant community organization efforts in this century. The Ready for Tulsa 100 campaign is literally about forming a large activist family comprised of Tulsans dedicating to nudging the city of Tulsa and all its residents, businesses, and other organizations into transitioning from fossil energy to clean renewable energy by 2050. As the date 2050 signifies, this will be at least a 30-year effort. Therefore, the RF100 Tulsa campaign family must, like any natural family, be comprised of multiple generations so that the cause will thrive even as its older members pass away. There are two main motivations for those of us who have joined and will join the RF100 Tulsa campaign. For most, it is the climate change challenge that threatens life as we know it for humans and all other living things. For others, it is the realization that transitioning from fossil energy to clean renewable energy is perhaps the 21st century's most important key to socioeconomic well-being. So the climate challenge is my motivation for being here. Uh, I have dedicated my retirement to doing everything I can to help in the cause of mitigating climate change. 
Um, Reverend Hiley talked to me in the song, The Tree of Life, I'm entitled to the tree of life. There's coming generations who will not have that tree of life to which they should be entitled if we don't get this job done. So, next slide. So here's the Tulsa Ready for 100 <coughs> campaign has as its goal getting the U.S. cities, counties, and states to commit to two big energy goals. 100% of electricity used within their borders generated by clean renewable sources by 2035, just 15 years away roughly, and 100% of all energy used within their borders provided by clean renewable sources by 2050. Now this wasn't just an arbitrary set of goals. These are the goals that the international, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says we must meet if we're going to successfully mitigate climate change so that we can hold down the horrible effects of the climate change that could occur if we keep business as usual. So, motivations. First, mitigating climate change. This is a busy graph but it shows the increased risk of climate change harm for five categories of harm as global average temperature increases above the pre-industrial level from zero to about 2.5 degrees. As you can see, the risks rise significantly as the temperatures rise. Currently, if we, meaning the world, do everything right, we may be able to keep the rise at around 1.5 degree level. The two degree level is the point at which the outlook for all things living on Earth start to become dire. If we can keep it, if we miss the two, getting to two, the 1.5, if we can at least hold it at two, it's better than where we would be otherwise, but not nearly as good as 1.5. The unique harms that they're talking about are unique and threatened systems, meaning ecological and human systems that have re restricted geographic range, ranges constricted by climate-related conditions. There, then there's extreme weather events. R the risk impacts to human health, livelihoods, assets, and ecosystems from extreme weather events such as heat waves, heavy rain, drought and associated wildfires and coast, coastal flooding. Our friends and neighbors in California are experiencing these things. Distribution of impacts. These are risks and impacts that disproportionately affect particular groups due to uneven distribution of physical climate change hazards, exposures, or vulnerability. So if you take the equator and the two longitudinal lines just above and below, and you spread that band all around the world, that's where the most vulnerable people are going to be as climate change uh, progresses. <coughs> global aggregate impacts. This is global monetary damage, global scale degradation, and loss of ecosystems and biodiversity. Large scale singular events. These are relatively large, abrupt, and sometimes irreversible changes in systems that are caused by global warming. Examples include disintegration of Greenland and the Arctic ice sheets. Slide four shows the other motivation, economic peril. So this contrasts the carbon budgets for achieving 1.5 degree and 1.75 degree goals with the current level of proved coal, gas, and oil reserves. This shows that to stay on budget, production and consumption of these reserves must end somewhere between 2030 and 2040, leaving the fossil fuel industry struck with, struck, excuse me, stuck with trillions of stranded costs. So in the slide, you see that the coal industry had already banked away 132 years worth of production. The gas industry, 51, and oil, 50. So you can tell, stopping at the points that I said they need to stop, that means all, a big bunch, most of all that banked reserves must stay in the ground. So you can imagine then what happens to economies that are dependent upon oil and gas as a big source of revenue. And so 
This is what's happening to the coal industry. This could be us in about five to 10 years. Uh, if things start really cranking up in terms of people doing what's necessary to mitigate climate change. I don't want Tulsa, Oklahoma to look like some coal town in West Virginia. I don't want Oklahoma to look like West Virginia. So that's why I'm part of the reason I'm on the campaign to try to get us to make this transition. So to develop effective local RF100 campaigns capable of convincing communities and governments that the RF1 goals are feasible, desirable, and equitable, that's what Nancy and I and Edith will be talking about. I and Edith will talk about feasibilities, Edith will, and Nancy will talk about desirabilities, and Nancy will talk about equity. So what, how do we define clean renewable energy? This is carbon-free, pollution-free energy provided sustainably by wind, solar, tidal, geothermal, low-impact small hydroelectric facilities, some biomass, and existing hydroelectric facilities. So let's talk about feasibility. You might question the political feasibility of this, but already 141 cities, 11 counties, nine states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico are committed to the RF100 goals. I won't, should be seven states and two territories. That's how I got the nine, I'm sorry. In any event, these are the committed counties and these are the committed states. And uh, we hope someday Oklahoma will be on that list. Six cities have already achieved the Ready for 100 electricity goals. Aspen, Colorado, Burlington, Vermont, Georgetown, Texas, Texas, <laughs> Greenberg, Kansas, Kodiak, Alaska, Island, Alaska, and Rockport, Missouri. Some of you may recognize the name Greenberg, Kansas. Sorry, I <laughs> Some of you may recognize <laughs> the name Gr Greenberg, Kansas. That's the small Kansas community about a decade ago that was blown away by a tornado. Almost every structure was blown down and they vowed to come back and they said let's not just come back let's come back in a better form and they came back this form green they put the green in greenberg so the key ingredients to achieving feasibility are conservation electrification and decarbonization so this chart is prepared by the Solutions Project. It is an offshoot of uh, research professors and teachers at Stanford and Cal Berkeley. Um, this is a scenario that they, they, they've done a lot of modeling, and this is what they believe can happen in Oklahoma. By 2050, improved energy efficiency will have reduced energy demand by 39% a demand that will be met by wind, water, sun, and maybe sun geothermal. So this is the projection about what energy sources will be. Uh, mostly it's solar, about, if you add up all the solar components that they have here, it's about 33.5%. Wind, about 65%, and hydroelectric, about 1.5%. Now, solar comes in various forms, residential solar, utility scale solar, concentrated solar, uh, community and government rooftop solar, and then wind is going to be off onshore since we don't have an offshore to worry about, unless we're going to stick this out in the middle of Grand Lake somewhere. Next. 
So what I'm going to show now is that Oklahoma is abundant in clean renewable energy. There's no reason why we can't be a leader in clean renewable energy as we've been in oil and gas for all these years. So if you look at the wind resources map here, purple and shades of purple and darker orange, those are the high wind areas. And you see that there's three corridors, the both coasts and the, the column of the states that we're in. So wind resources are defined by wind speed which is measured in meters per second. And where we are, we're somewhere between eight and a half, nine, eight and a half, eight, maybe seven and a half meters per second. That's very high. It's, it's an abundant amount of wind resources. Here's where we are ranked nationally. We rank third in installed wind capacity. And as a consequence, there was an interesting report coming out given some of the hostility that those of us who are working for these, these goals I've talked about have experienced in the legislature with respect to solar power. Um, because of this, we now are ranked as one of the highest, we're up real high in the ranking of states that are going green. But we could be so much better. Next map. So this is the solar irradiance map of the US as a resources for photovoltaic solar power on the left and concentrated solar on the right. Solar irradiance is a measure of energy transmitted from the sun in the form of rays or waves or particles. In this case, the energy is measured in kilowatt hours per meter second per day. Various shades of brown and orange show the areas with high solar resources. And you can see on the map that Oklahoma has good photovoltaic solar resources and better than average concentrated solar resources. And the thing about solar resources is a total of 173,000 terawatts. These are trillions of watts of solar energy strikes the Earth continuously, and that's more than 10,000 times the world's total energy use. That's what we can tap into if we do this right. So let's look at solar and see where we're ranked. We're ranked eighth in terms of solar resources in the nation. Unfortunately, we're 49th in utilization, almost totally due to legislative hostility and Oklahoma Corporation Commission hostility. The legal barrier in Oklahoma is a virtual ban on solar leasing. So I, I am one of many in this room would have solar on my house in a heartbeat if I could lease it rather than buy it and own it. I just don't want to keep up with it. And there's really great solar leasing companies, but the law is so stacked against it, not a single one of those companies will choose to do business here at the moment. A recent Oklahoma Attorney General opinion cast doubt on some of these solar leasing barriers, but it didn't clear all of them. But in light of this opinion, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission recently adopted rules that will liberalize its net metering rules. Net metering means that if you have a solar facility and it generates more electricity than you use, the excess goes back to the utility. Our rules used to say, you just gave a gift to the utility. You don't get paid for it. Uh, now the rule will be that you will get paid for it on a monthly basis. At the end of the month, they'll either write you a check or you'll write them a check. The bad part is that there are hearings ongoing right now where the two major utilities have come in and said, we don't think the value of this power is above more than three and a half cents a kilowatt hour, which would be the lowest in the nation and way too low to encourage solar leasing. So we have PFA advocates in that, those hearings as we speak, fighting a good fight to keep that from happening. Mm -hmm. 
So when I talked about worrying in terms of the economy suddenly going down because of changes that are coming, in many ways I'm optimistic despite our federal government's lack of desire of doing anything on these matters and recently pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreements. Uh, I am because technology in the private sector is making big advances and I only make me talk about a couple of them. Edith has much more in her presentation than I'm going to give right now. But one's advanced battery technology. The percent of natural gas used to generate electricity is 32.8% worldwide and 34% in the USA. Natural gas is being displaced by solar and wind power in many parts of our country. But there's still a role to balance what happens when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. But that role has, is on a time frame because the advanced battery technology, maybe within 10 years, will completely take away that market for natural gas. Electric vehicles, the percent of oil used for transportation is 56.6% worldwide, 71% in the United States. Electric vehicle costs are rapidly decreasing. Electric vehicle ranges are rapidly increasing. 16 nations are phasing out internal combustion engines, including China, Germany, the UK, France, and India, meaning they're passing laws setting time frames for not allowing those kinds of engines to be put in vehicles any longer. I have helped organize three electric vehicle shows in the last 14 months, and all of the dealers I've mentioned or talked with said that they've gone to their, their, their sales managers have come back from their manufacturer conventions, and they're telling the dealers here that by 2022, almost all their vehicles will be electrified in some way, either a conventional hybrid, a plug-in hybrid, or battery, a total battery car or vehicle. Some of those companies have a goal that uh, by 2030 no longer manufacturing vehicles with internal combustion engines. VW, Dam Daimler, BMW, Volvo, and the Chinese. Chinese has about 100 car companies, and they're all being asked by the government to go electric just as rapidly as they can get there. So how about feasibility in Tulsa, Oklahoma? I'm quoting now from the Tulsa City, City of Tulsa Sustainability Plan in 2011. There is an economic transformation taking place today, a transformation from the old economy that is high pollution, high carbon, waste intensive, and ecologically disruptive, to a new economy that is low pollution, energy resource efficient, low or zero carbon, and sociologically supported. Then they conclude this way, business cities and regions that lead this economic transformation will prosper because the new economy will outperform and eventually replace the old one in the long run. Businesses, cities, and regions that lag are in danger of being left behind. 